Well, it is day one of the post-conference retreat, and I'm here with this beautiful wild sunflower. It's pretty, pretty nice. Uh, so, I think it's too early to really say too much about the um, conference itself, other than it went great. A couple hiccups, 97%, uh, 98% smooth. Ray said it was 98%, 98.2% perfect or something like that. He had a few ways of saying it. Basically, like, the remote access guests, I think, got kind of a raw deal the first day because, um, well, there was a whole technical problem. We found out the day before that the venue didn't have internet, despite the fact they had put in a wireless hotspot. They had never configured it correctly. We got another one. One we got didn't work very well. I mean... There were a lot of technical issues for the streamers. We recorded everything, that's great, but it was very stressful. First couple days for me were pretty stressful. I was up till 4 a.m. both nights, sleeping on a couch at the venue. I actually slept on the couch at the venue every night during the conference because we had to be there late into the night doing technical things, and we also had to break down and tear, you know, tear down and set up every day. I think we're only going to rent that venue for like one day next year and use other venues for other days because all of the setup and teardown was really annoying. And then we're gonna make sure we don't have anything that requires streaming there because the internet's just too unreliable there. You know, I have rock solid gigabit internet at my house, business class, whatever, works great. They had a little, you know, they had a little hotspot and the hotspot kept dropping. And then the other thing is for the remote guests, next year I'm gonna have a totally dedicated 100% remote guest thing where the speakers are doing presentations to the remote guests with anyone watching the presentation behind the speaker, behind them, looking at the same screen. You know, I have a 70 inch screen. We put all the remote guests up on Zoom on the screen. The speaker stands facing them. Anyone watching watches from the side or behind the speaker, kind of, you know, showing up on the Zoom. And so that way we have all of this remote content where everybody's in sync. For those who caught my objective personality work, I'm on the feeling side of the binary, which means it's my responsibility to get everyone on the same page. It's my responsibility to get everyone in sync. And so how do I get people in sync? Well, prevent split focus. Split focus is when the speaker is talking to the room and the Zoom recording is being like, hey, we can't hear anything, or hey, can you ask the speaker this? Can you tell the speaker to speak closer into the mic? All this stuff. And it's like split focus because the speaker doesn't want to have to keep looking at the Zoom chat while they're also talking to the room. And I have to come up, I mean, at one point, I had to come up and ask the speaker to start their whole talk over, which I did, and they did, very obligingly. Thank you, Lisa. But it was not easy, you know? So I think to make things easier, because part of this is a celebration and a vacation, and I mean, look how beautiful it is here. Like, we just want to come here and enjoy and, and love Santa Fe and not have to be so stressed, is going to be having a dedicated, probably at my house, with my gigabit connection, remote streaming room, where we have programmed content of all the speakers who are coming to HDHD, and they're just going one after the next, directly to the Zoom, directly. They're giving the talk to the Zoom from that room. And then other people who happen to come in and wanna watch can watch from the sidelines. And you know, I have a room that can fit like 30 people. That'll be fine. And that'll be a lot easier than being in the chaos of 100 plus people sometimes, you know? So that's one thing. Other than that, we had a couple no-shows. I was one of the no-shows. Thankfully, we, we rescheduled my talk and got it on. We also uh, we had a couple other no-shows that we were not able to reschedule. That was a bummer, and it's always the question of, like, judgment versus mercy. Like, do I not invite them back? Did they have a good reason for being a no-show? In my opinion, three of them, I think actually the only three no-shows will not be invited back, did not have a good reason. But if they are at the conference next year and they don't want to be on the schedule, they just want to spontaneously do their talk, that's wonderful. I'm not going to name names, but the three no-shows, to me, seemed very um, uninvested in the conference. They got free tickets in exchange for talking, used those free tickets to attend the conference, and then didn't talk. 
And so there were three no-shows. Actually, one was a performance. And, you know, they can come back next year. I'm not like some jerk. Right? This, this is like 45 things. And they can even do the talk next year, just not on the schedule. Or they can do the performance, but not on the schedule. Uh, you know, one was a singing bowl performance. A lot of people showed up to see it. Didn't happen. It was a no-show. You know, these, these things happen, but at the same time, I'm not going to, like, give that person a comp ticket and a gift bag and all this stuff. Because of that, so I just want people to know we take the no-shows very seriously. Also, we do have a policy if there ever is a no-show, or rather a cancellation, we replace it with something so people who show up get something. So, for instance, James had a family medical emergency, canceled at the last minute, 20 minutes before. That's not a no-show. You know why? We got Victoria Jane to fill in, and it was amazing. Sometimes the spontaneous stuff is amazing. So we kind of have a policy at HDHD. If anything is canceled, we replace it. That's why the no-shows hurt so much, because you have people sitting there waiting for the talk that never happens. It's just very disrespectful to everyone. I mean, not even posting on Telegram. We had all the attendees on Telegram kind of watching for alerts and asking, is so-and-so going to show up and what's going on? The least a speaker can do is say, I'm not going to be there. I'm not really worried if a speaker's 10 minutes late. I'm not really worried if a speaker goes over and the next thing starts late. That's fine. I'm worried if there's a no-show because people start to lose confidence in the events. And in one case... One of the no-shows, nobody showed up to his next talk because, um, you know, I think they had the idea that he might not show up. And then in that case, he didn't show up to that either. He canceled. So he had one no-show and one cancel. We replaced him with someone else. They drove across town to give the talk. Everyone would have loved to hear them give the talk, but they didn't know because it was at the last minute. And because of his previous no-show, they didn't show up. So it's like no-shows teach people to not trust the schedule. But that being said, we had three total no-shows. Actually, four if you include mine. But I, mine was a cancellation to notify people, I guess. But And we also rescheduled it. But I'll say four. We had four total no-shows. And uh, of those four no-shows, that was out of 55 main stage talks, 43, 44 workshops, and around 50 special events. So with 150 things happening, you know, four, not, we did pretty well this year. Pretty, pretty, pretty well. So uh, what else can I say about this year? I mean, so much. I have so much footage. I'm going to spend the next week just uploading footage. I'm trying to edit some of it first. Some of it I'll just upload unedited. So much good stuff. Um, gosh magical moments. Because the stream was so messed up this year, I went out of my way to just record non-stop. Now I got to get permission from some of the people I recorded. You know, now I got to get permission from some of the folks that I was recording their candid conversations. So that's its own journey, but uh, some have already said no, which is too bad because they had some pretty great convos. But the ones that have said yes, I'm going to be uploading, and then the ones where it's just me kind of showing the scenes, not like a personal candid conversation. Um, and, you know, they, they knew I was recording, so it's not like any of it was, like, secret. It's just some people need clarity to see how they feel, like, after it's been recorded. In the future, I'm just going to have big signs everywhere that's like, you are being recorded. 100% of everything you say in this space is safe for me to record and use. <laughs> and if people aren't comfortable, they can leave and go to a private space. Because there's plenty of private rooms, you know. They can go hang out in my master bedroom suite where we did all the wine tastings and that can be the recording free zone and if you want to have a deep personal private convo but i loved hearing all the spontaneous readings i loved hearing all the spontaneous conversations going into very deep topics and i managed to record a ton of them partly because i wanted to make up for the lack of smooth technical experience in the main stage you know the main stage was like so janky that first day with our internet dropping that I was like okay what can I do to make up for this I'm just going to give people like hours of extra content as much as I possibly can so I was like filling up phones borrowing other people's phones filling up laptops 
webcams, mics, anything I could find. So I recorded a ton. Got that. I'll be uploading that a bunch. This was a very expansive conference. Like, even half of the things that happened at this conference, if they happened at one of the others, it would have been enough. You know, as an example, in 2022, we had like a, a nodal shift field trip and, you know, filmed a little video about it with Dave Myers. This year, we had like eight field trips and as many as three or possibly four documentaries going on at once being filmed. You know what I mean? It's kind of crazy. There's the one first documentary that, that kind of started it, started by a manifester who kind of initiated it. Then a second documentary. Then a guy showed up on the pre-conference day doing a third documentary. And then I had a conversation with someone else who said that they got a ton of footage, which may turn into a documentary. So I'm like, wow, four documentaries being filmed. Pretty cool. So it was just very expansive. Um, we had James Dean's rapping. It was amazing. You know, that we had Dave Myers performing. He cut his set short, but what he did play, great. Everyone was laughing and loving it and his purity of his personality and his sincerity and innocence and just earnestness really shone through. We had Hanifa Adil, absolute highlight of the conference, doing stand-up comedy. She did like a 10, 12 minute stand-up comedy routine, which is not easy. She'd been writing the jokes for four months. To fill up 12 minutes is like a lot. And they were hilarious and they built on each other. It was amazing. Um, it's, all, it's all recorded. James is all recorded, you know. I'll be getting these uploaded. Um, God, I don't even know where to begin. The events were so great. We're gonna change a lot of things next year because the events were so good. Talks were great too, but we don't need that venue so much because it takes up so much work to run. We needed to have greeters, you know, greeter shifts, nine to one and one to five. Two greeters at a time, plus baristas running the kitchen, plus closing crew, plus people running the stream. It took 30 people and we were all exhausted. And I want people to have a good time and enjoy the event even if they are volunteers. I don't want them to work their butt off the whole time. You know, volunteers are people too. Organizers are people too. We wanna to have a good time too. I made sure to have a good time. I prioritized that, but I also have a defined G. It won't let me not have a good time. It'll pull me away. But undefined Gs need us defined Gs to protect them, advocate for them, shield them, tell them it's okay to leave early, Tell them they don't have to work tomorrow. So on day one, I told our greeter coordinator, she has the rest of the week off. She didn't, she, she kept coordinating, she kept working, but you know, I did my best to try to make sure people knew they didn't just, even if they were volunteering. I mean, she was paid even. She was, she was paid, um, sorry, she paid us. Like a paid attendee who just took on all these responsibilities I mean, for me, it's like, is this heaven? But of course, um, you know, I don't want paid attendees. I don't want anyone to have to work the whole time at the conference. And, you know, we're gonna have to adjust some things financially next year. We had something like 22 paid attendees this year. And each and every one of them, I'm extremely grateful for. We gave away 25 tickets for financial aid and another 25 reduced rate. But then the reduced rate people, none of them could pay it. So many of them ended up coming anyway. So it was close to 50. Then we had over 50 organizers and speakers. And then they all got one comp ticket. So that's around 150 comp tickets. Not all those people showed up. But we can't do 150 comp tickets next year. Um, we just can't. Unless we get a really big venue. Because we actually did close ticket sales and sold out and a few people messaged me and uh, I pretty much told everyone who messaged me to come. Not all of them did because it was last minute and things. Overall, it was a huge success. It was break even or a couple thousand bucks in the hole. I don't mind. If I end up spending two to five thousand dollars a year to throw what to me is the highlight of the year, I'm fine with that. 
overall, I do think we need new ticketing structure. And instead of giving free tickets to those in financial need, I think we need to give reduced rate tickets only, you know? Um, because instead, we created this thing where those who got the reduced rate tickets didn't want them, and then explained why their financial needs made it so they couldn't spend that money. I want everyone to be able to come. I want, I want to do it for free. I mean, that would be my dream, you know? My absolute dream would be get sponsors and do the whole thing for free. At the same time, I understand the need to make it sustainable. And it also takes up a good three months of my life. I can't work on other projects. So, you know, the overall production is full-time three months. And at my old rate, uh, my company was billing my hours at $480,000 a year. So that would be around $120,000. Um, but that was when I was in the tech world. I certainly wasn't making that. That was what I was billed at. Um, but, you know, I would like to do it for free. That would be my dream. So I know what my time's worth. I know three months of my time is, is worth that. At the same time, I want to give it as a gift and be of service to others. And it makes me feel so good to not really get paid. And I don't. I actually pay money to put this on. But next year I have some people helping me and we're gonna figure out some of the ticketing structure and see if we can at least hit break even. This year we had, you know, some probably more speakers than ever before, more workshop organizers than ever before, more comps from the speakers and workshop organizers for their friends than ever before. I'm gonna email a lot of those comp tickets, ask for donations, see if I can get even a hundred bucks. If the hundred plus people who didn't weren't able to buy tickets each gave a hundred dollars, that would more than enough cover our cost for the event. People don't realize we put like um, Taos bake bars in the bags people got and like granola bars and probiotic sodas and we stocked up all the coffee and milk. Thank you Tila for donating all that milk. She got all the nut milks and the dairy milk and that was her donation. The rest of it we paid for over $2,000 just for little granola bars and probiotic sodas. And you might say, well, Jonah, those things aren't needed, but when you're at the high desert, they kind of are. People don't eat enough at the conference. They, they need calories. They need a Taos Bake, you know, granola bar, really nice, healthy granola bar to help stabilize. They need a good probiotic soda and they, they need water bottles. They need all this stuff. I mean, I wanted to buy everyone straw hats. So people don't realize, you know, tote bags cost a few thousand bucks. Schedules, I think, were 3,500 this year. Venue space, a couple thousand bucks. Um, and more sometimes, you know, depending on what venues we use. And, uh, you know, it adds up and that's okay. I mean, all the stuff we put in the totes, all the stuff we print out, all the technical things. We had so many wonderful donations this year of AV equipment for all the workshops. Thank you, thank you, thank you to each and every one of our donors. We made an Amazon registry gift list. People were buying $200 wireless mic sets that we can keep at the venues. My goal next year is every single venue is a dedicated mic recording setup. I have a bunch of old laptops, I'm gonna set them up with webcams, ready to go, ready to record with wireless clip-on mics that are charging and they're rechargeable, you know, dock. So that the speaker shows up, the greeter or the, you know, attendee, um, sorry, kind of host of the workshop, clips on a mic, presses record, done. That's my goal for next year. Uh, what else from the logistical side? A lot less chaotic than last year. Having fewer workshops during the day was a good call. I want to start them later in the day. My dream for next year, a bunch of smaller things with daily places, one daily place where everyone can go. Example, Wednesday morning, beginning of the conference, meet and greet at the park, 10 a.m. to noon. Everyone meets there. 
First workshop, one. Second workshop, four. That's it. Then, then, 6 p.m. opening night gala. Everyone can meet in the morning. Everyone can go to two workshops. Everyone can meet in the evening. Thursday, 10 a.m. meet and greet at the rail yard down, down in this arts district. Tons of cafes, restaurants, places all around there. There's a big central place. Easily 150 people can fit with shade and all this stuff. We all mob the rail yard. We all meet at the rail yard. Same deal. First workshop at one, second at three. Maybe we do a third workshop at six. That way they get a third one. Then after evening events, starting at eight. Day three, Friday. We do outings. Anyone who wants to meets at 10 a.m. at the cafe, at one cafe, to go on a hike. Or they meet at 10 a.m. at another cafe to go to a hot spring. Or they meet at 10 a.m. at a third cafe to go to Bandelier, this amazing cave dwelling site. It's a big outing day. Or those who want to stay in, I host a maximum 30 person workshop in my house called Melt Your Design. Thank you, Lila, for coming up with that name. I think in a vision that came to her and she kept thinking we need to melt our designs, not be so rigid and strict. She's been in the experiment 14 years. And so this Melt Your Design, then I came up with a follow-up. The next day, Meld Your Design. Uh, partnership analysis workshop all day. So people who want to go on the retreats, sorry, I'm just checking. I always check the lending libraries. Oh, Herbs of the Pacific Northwest. Nice. I'll give this to my dad. He lives there. Oh my God. Alan Watts. Please. Yes. Thank you. Love him. He was the exact same personality type as Ra. So people who study the objective personality system um, okay, complete indoor gardeners, sweet home Chicago, the bird tribes, cool books. Okay, so check this out. Okay, so next year, meet and greet at the park Wednesday, two workshops, opening night gala. Meet and greet at the rail yard Thursday, three workshops, evening events, trivia, stand-up comedy, you know, whatever. Day three, Friday, meet and greet at my house, for, or actually Frenchie's Field Park by my house, hanging out, and then people either go to cafes from there, maybe they'll, they'll meet, meet at, my, at the park by my house, 10 a.m., cafes, get there by 11 if they want to, maybe I'll even say 9 a.m. by my house, cafes where the smaller groups will go who want to go um, on the field trips, right? Field trip to Bandelier, field trip to Hot Springs, a bunch of different smaller field trips. Uh, Richard Corbett can take people kayaking on the river. Meanwhile, I do a 30 to 40 person workshop, Melt Your Design. The next day I do a 30 to 40 person workshop, Meld Your Design, all partnership. People who go to one, kind of a commit, it's like a two day commitment. You go to one, you get the other. These are free, by the way. I mean, they're included in the price of your ticket. There's no extra, we've never, ever, ever had any extra fees for any event that's put on by HDHD. Sometimes, like two or three speakers a year, will put on special paid events outside of HDHD. We can't exactly tell them not to. We strongly encourage that they consider making them free. Sometimes they just make them extremely reduced rate. So you're getting like a third of the price of what you'd have to pay otherwise. Uh, but either way, everything we put on is completely included in the ticket. So yeah, that's kind of the idea. The idea is next year we have like this kind of schedule of like no central main location. Just we all meet in the morning. If you sleep in, you're nocturnal, you're, you're indirect light, no problem. Come to our evening events. But if you're up, you come meet us at the place we all meet. You see your friends. Hey, what are you going to do? Gives everyone a chance to kind of say, hey, are you going to the hot springs? I don't know. I think I want to go kayaking. Or I don't know. I think I want to go to the cave dwellings. And then the groups that organize go from there to their destination. And then we have like all day workshops here. Maybe I'll do Melt Your Design. Maybe I'll get Randy and Richard to do their own workshop, something like that. And so then that takes up Friday. Uh, Saturday, I think we all meet at the rail yard again because it's the farmer's market. 
And then we have workshops in the afternoon. And then Saturday night dance party, like we always do. And then this is just a much more sane five days that maximizes, you know, maximizes um, connection, communion, and experiential. Uh, you know, that's kind of my idea there. So anyway, love to hear feedback from people. That's just kind of where I'm going with it. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's much else to say. Definitely a lot of G-Center learnings this year, learnings about expectations, um, learnings about how the G-Center works. Someone with an undefined G-Center uh, was so worried he had disappointed me. And he said, do you still love me, Jonah? And I said, my love is unconditional. But I make a velvet rope, and you're not going to be able to touch the AV equipment after that. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, please. Yeah. No, but that's the whole thing, though, is I think the undefined G-Center can be so concerned. Like, do you still love me after this? And if it's a true love, it is unconditional. It's not calculated. It's not, I love you because of what you did for me. It's, I love you because of who you are. Or just, I love you. I love who you are. Not even because. Because, well... Who knows what, what because means, right? So when it comes to like disappointment, you can only be disappointed if you have expectations. Of course, it's impossible to have no expectations, but I think the closer we get to no expectations, the more we protect our own spirit and maintain our own ability to continue loving and to keep going in our direction. I think that's a good place to end. Thanks all.